Well, good afternoon on this Good Friday. It's a very ironic term because the events of 2,000 years ago um, are better described as evil, uh, even horrific. But looking back on the cross through the lens of the resurrection, we understand its purpose and we can affirm this is indeed a Good Friday. We know the end of the story. And uh, in our service today, we'll be tracing the steps of the Savior using five readings from Mark's gospel, and we'll respond to those readings in song and, and lament that remind us of Christ's suffering and death for us. And we call this a tenebrae service. That's the Latin word for shadows or darkness, because uh, throughout the service, we'll gradually extinguish candles and, and bring the lights down to symbolize the snuffing out of the life of Christ, the light of the world. We'll end our service in darkness with grief that the God-man Jesus died, and we'll depart from this service in silence, meditating on these truths that define all of history and even eternity. And so let's begin our service with our call to worship. You can stand. We'll read these words responsively from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. Let's pray. King of glory, we adore you, our Savior and our Lord. You suffered on the cross, you gave your life as a ransom for many. We bless you and thank you for the outpouring of your love for us, and we offer our worship today uh, out of unspeakable gratitude. This we pray in your name, amen. Please join us in singing together. Oh 
seated. I will see. 
17, verses 16 through 20. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. This is God's word. Step three, crucifixion at Calvary, Mark 15, 21 to 32. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passed by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you, are, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. 
Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who crucified him also heaped insults on him. This is God's word. Please join me in reading the corporate prayer. Gracious Lord Jesus, who readily forgives the thief and the murderer, the adulterer and the tax collector. We sinners cast ourselves on our mercy. We receive your sacrifice on Calvary as the atonement of our sins. We claim your perfect record as our righteousness before God. We believe your wondrous promises of the everlasting paradise. We trust you, Jesus. Amen.
we come to a moment in our service that we call the proclamation of Christ's substitutionary atonement. Those are big words. Um, substitutionary just simply means that Jesus died in our place. He was our substitute. And atonement means that he is the sacrifice that took away our sins, that paid the penalty that our sins deserve. And so with that in mind, hear these gospel words from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 11. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, As a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. This is the word of God.
Step four, death in the darkness, Mark 15, 33 through 39. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Elo, Eloi, Limo, Zabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. This is God's word. The measure of someone's love can be seen in what they're willing to do for the sake of the one that they love. The measure of someone's love can be seen in what they're willing to endure for the sake of the one they love. Parents are willing to endure countless hours and dollars and time for the sake of their kids. Many are willing to lay down their lives for those they love. We understand that great love is characterized by great sacrifice. And yet nothing compares to the love of God for us in the sacrifice of Jesus. We've sung about the wonder, wonderful cross, but as I said at the beginning, the cross was horrific. It's only wonderful because it expresses what God was willing to do, what God was willing to endure because of his love for us. It's wonderful because only the cross solves the biggest problem in the universe. It certainly solves our biggest problem, right? The problem of our sin and guilt and shame because Jesus' death removes all of that from us. But an, an even bigger problem is the problem that our sin poses for God. God is love, but God is also holy, and we deserve judgment, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the Apostle Paul explains in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, when he writes, Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. You might wonder. If God loves us, why can't he just forgive us without this whole cross thing? Right? You might say, I forgive people all the time and I don't require someone to be punished for it, so why can't God? The answer to that is that you're not also the judge of the universe. God is both perfectly loving and perfectly holy. He's both a loving father and a just judge. God is perfectly holy, right? Sin cannot come into his presence. The relationship between God's holiness and our sin has been explained in terms of the relationship between a lit match and a piece of paper. And when you bring the two together, the match consumes the paper. It can't do anything else. God is absolutely holy and cannot allow sin in his presence. His goodness means that he must oppose evil. But God is loving and longs to show mercy to sinful people. He wants to have a relationship with us. We think we have a problem in that our sin separates us from God, but God has a problem. Will his love give way to his justice, 
or will his justice give way to his love? It seems that God has to compromise some aspect of his character one way or the other. But the cross resolves this deepest of all problems in the universe, the problem that our sin poses to God. Only the cross shows us how inviolably holy God is. And only the cross allows us to see how incredibly loving God is. How does it do that? Well, Jesus gives us a profound picture of how he solves this problem when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. On the night of his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, while anticipating his imminent crucifixion, Jesus poured out his heart to God the Father in prayer. He prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And then a short while later, as the soldiers come to arrest him, Peter resists initially and and, and, and tries to stop them, but Jesus says to Peter, put away your sword. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And so what is this cup that Jesus is referring to? Well, in both the Old and the New Testaments, the cup of God refers to God's judgment. Here are just a couple of examples among many. In the Old Testament, first in Jeremiah 25, verse 15 Speaking about God's judgment on the nations, God tells Jeremiah this. He says, Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. In the New Testament, in Revelation 14, verse 9, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand... He too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And so we see just from these two examples that the cup is a metaphor for God's judgment on sin. But when Jesus died on the cross, as he explained to Peter in Gethsemane, Jesus drank that cup of God's judgment. He drank the cup the Father had given him. And in so doing, he consumed the wrath of God for all of God's people. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Isaiah 53.6 we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of, of us all. The cup of God's wrath that we should have to drink, Jesus takes out of our hands and drinks it for us so that we don't have to. On the cross, Jesus bore the full, furious, unmitigated, dreadful wrath of Almighty God for you and for me. God held nothing back. Jesus took it all. Jesus' cry at the end when he said, it is finished, was not a cry of relief that it was finally over. It was a cry of triumph because he had accomplished what he had come to do. As we sang earlier, your king has come to die. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. He stood in our place, bearing the guilt and punishment for our sin. Romans 5.9 says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? During that dark and terrible afternoon when Jesus hung on the cross, the cup of God's wrath was completely turned upside down and poured out on his son. And there's nothing left in that cup for God's people. For all who trust in Christ by faith, there is nothing left in the cup. It's empty. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And in this way, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit demonstrated the greatest possible love by enduring the greatest possible sacrifice. 
But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus' work on the cross was the fullest expression of the love of the Father for us. And at the same time, it satisfied God's holy justice for sin, resolving the tension between the two. The cross enabled God to be both just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. And so if you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, if you're living your life on your own terms, you've never declared your allegiance to Jesus, realize, realize that you're still holding the cup of God's wrath in your hands. Perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But the end of that chapter also reminds us, again, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. You're still holding the cup in your hands, but you don't have to drink it. You can give it to Jesus by believing and following Him. And you can do that through a simple prayer. Expressing your faith in Him, you might pray something like this, just a sample prayer. Lord Jesus, I admit that I am far more sinful than I ever believed, and through you I am more loved and accepted than I ever dared hope. I thank you for bearing the punishment for my sin, dying on the cross in my place, and for offering forgiveness and new life. And because you died for me, I want to live for you. Just a simple prayer. You might pray that or something similar, expressing your faith in Jesus. And if you do, you will experience what Good Friday is all about. As God pours out his love on you because he poured out his wrath on Jesus in your place. For those of us who are trusting Christ, Good, Good Friday reminds us how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God for us in Christ. Because Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath, God is free to shower us with his love. And if great love is characterized by great sacrifice, there could be no greater love for you than the love of God who didn't spare his own son, but freely gave him up for us all. Amen. Step five, burial in Joseph's tomb, Mark fifteen. 42 to 47. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' Jesus's body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. This is the word of God. Please stand and read the bold type in the prayer of thanksgiving. For leaving the glories of heaven and descended into the world. We thank you, Lord Jesus. For living a perfect life and granting us undeserved benefits. We thank you, Lord Jesus. For praying passionately for us with blood and tears for substituting your life on the cross for us that we may live. We thank you, Lord Jesus. For rising from the dead, ascending to heaven, and interceding for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus. For your promise to come back soon to gather us 
to yourself. we stand here in the dark, the dark represents death, the death of the tomb, death that even took the Lord of life. And when that happened, the disciples were in despair. They fled, they scattered, they hid because they didn't yet understand what would happen on the third day. But we do. This light, lone candle that is flickering behind us under the cross reminds us that there is hope coming, resurrection hope. On the third day, we know the story, Jesus will rise from the dead. And so we leave here tonight grieving the loss, the death of the Son of God for us, but we will return on Sunday morning with great joy, celebrating his victory over death in his resurrection from the dead. So receive this good word from the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Let us go from this place in silence, uh, proclaiming our Savior's death until he comes. Amen. Go in peace.